Welcome back everyone. TryHackMe just came out with a Windows Forensics Room and I've had a look at it. I've used TryHackMe for a while and I really like it. The Windows Forensics Room specifically covers Windows Registry Analysis. It's a really interesting room to look at and I'm glad that they're finally doing more with Digital Forensics. So today's going to be a walkthrough of their Windows Forensics Room. So to get started, I'm on TryHackMe dot com slash room windows forensics one I've already logged in and this is a free room at least for now so you should have access to it no problem just gonna jump right in here we don't have to start an attack box or anything like that although they will have one I think a little bit later let's go ahead and with task one so introduction to windows forensics if you've been watching my channel at all you've probably heard me talk about forensic artifacts before is my computer spying on me a lot of people think that their computer is spying on them and there are a lot of analytics and trackers built into many different operating systems these days especially Especially Microsoft Windows, but most of the time it's about user preferences when running the system. So Windows and especially the Windows registry keeps track of a lot of user activities. That way the user can easily access those later or Windows can preload things that it thinks the user is going to use. Basically we just read a couple things and then what is the most used desktop operating system right now? The most used desktop operating system right now is Microsoft Windows. However, mobile really took over desktop several years ago. So it's not the most most popular operating system anymore, but Microsoft Windows is still the most popular desktop operating system. Let's go ahead and try that. Okay. What's the term used to define a piece of evidence of human activity? Piece of evidence of human activity, I'm guessing they're talking about forensic artifacts. And if you read this, if you hear the word artifact, it refers to essential pieces of information that provide a piece of human activity. Really, it doesn't matter if it's necessarily human activity or not. It's An artifact is anything that is used to build up your evidence. If you have some sort of claim that you're trying to prove, you're looking for evidence to support that claim. Artifacts are anything that can potentially contain that evidence. So if you're trying to prove, for example, that the sky is blue, then an artifact would be related to that, whether it was necessarily human activity or not. But I understand what they're trying to say with this. It's kind of easier to conceptualize if it's like a user action. And really, whenever we're looking in Microsoft Windows, especially desktop, most of the time we're looking for those artifacts because they're related to human actions. So let's try artifact. Ta-da. Next, getting into Windows Registry. All right, we got a couple tools here. So an overview of the Windows Registry. You can think of the Windows Registry like a database that keeps track of all of the settings in Windows. So whether you're changing your background image or whether you're going to a website, the Windows Registry will have several different registry keys that are updated whenever uh, you make any type of action. All of them are stored in different registry hives and basically they're going through each of the different registry hives here. Each hive contains different information from the system so it depends what you're looking for which hive you're more likely to find it in and sometimes you'll have information across different hives as well but if you're looking at it on your own system you can use regedit.exe but be careful about this because if you do start changing registry keys you can break windows <laughs> so um, if you're running it on your own system and not a test system uh, be careful <laughs> and then they're going through all of the different hives and interesting things that might be in there so what we normally do in digital forensic investigations is access the registry hives offline and for that we're getting for example a suspect hard drive and then we're parsing out that hard drive and looking at the file system once we reconstruct the file system, then we get full paths just like you would have whenever you're looking at a, a suspect's computer while it's on. Um, and then we have to look, for example, in C drive Windows System32 config for uh, the majority of the system hives. And then we also have NT user and user class.dat that are usually found in the C user's username. And then you'll have your NT user.dat and then app data local Microsoft Windows is usually where you'll find the user class. They're going over the locations of these hives because they contain so much information information and they're extremely relevant to pretty much every investigation you're going to do. So one of the first things you want to look for whenever you're doing an investigation of Windows computers is where are the hives and, and start to parse those hives out. What's the short form for H key local machine? Uh, shorten it by just doing HK to stand for H key. That way we know it's a key in the Windows system and then take the first letter from the next word. So we have H key, H K L M. So let's try that H K L M. 
Okay, what's the path of the five main registry hives, default SAM, security, software, and system? Notice this has nothing to do with the user per se. Basically, they don't contain the user's settings. So we're looking for the system settings, and I can already see here that there's probably a drive number. This is a little bit misleading because this is probably asking for, for example, C drive, so like C drive slash Windows. The problem is you don't have to install uh, Windows in the C drive. You can install it in another drive. So don't always assume that it's going to be in C drive, but 99% of your cases it's going to be, so we're just gonna do it here. So we're looking at C drive slash Windows. If I spell it right, slash system32 slash config. This is where our uh, registry hives are normally located. Let's try that. What is the path for the Amcache hive? The Amcache hive stores information about programs that were run. And let's look at the format here. It looks like probably they're looking for the system folder, so C drive, Windows, assuming it's installed in C drive. And then they have the dot here with the three after, so most likely they're actually looking for the hive file itself, not just the path. All right, so let's do C drive, Windows. That's our system folder, or at least the default um, uh, system folder. We have app, compat, and then we have programs, am, cache.hve. Let's try that. And that's it. Let's see, they also list it up here as well, so you could have just copied that one. <laughs> okay. I shouldn't have typed it out. Okay, so next, going to Windows re Registry. We are looking here at a couple different tools that they have available, several open source tools. This Winder is the system directory. So for example, it would be C drive Windows in most cases, but you can change the location. So you do need to try to parse out the Windows Registry to understand where the Windows um, uh, system folder is installed. It's one of the first things you should do before assuming C drive. And then we have CAPE, a really nice tool, and I think that's what they prefer for this uh, this exercise. Autopsy, another awesome tool. I use this all the time for uh, investigations. FTK Imager for doing acquisitions. Uh, FTK Imager is really good for acquisitions as well as the hex viewer and the uh, file viewer. So if you just want to do a really quick investigation in Windows, you can use FTK Imager to do almost everything. It has keyword searching, um, hex views, a lot of things. And it can also acquire not only disks, but RAM. So there's Access Data's Registry Viewer. Access Data just got bought by another company. I don't for remember what their name is, but um, the Registry Viewer is very interesting. The problem with it is you can only load one uh, hive at a time, but it is pretty good for doing research on Windows registry changes. There's also Zimmerman's Registry Explorer, excellent tool, uh, also for just, just exploring, obviously, the registry and doing searches through it. So um, another great tool and a little bit more powerful. And then Reg Ripper is kind of the de facto standard for registry analysis. Uh, it's a collection of scripts for parsing out different uh, data types. And Reg Ripper is actually built into Autopsy. So if you're running Autopsy that was listed above, you'll already kind of get Reg Ripper. But if you want to be able to customize it a little bit more, you can run Reg Ripper uh, by itself. They just say study the tools. Okay, so basically download some interesting tools. And if you subscribe to this channel, I will be talking about all those tools. I already have videos on FTK Imager, Autopsy, um, and a couple of the other tools I will get into more later. So uh, like and subscribe if you want to see more of that. So we know where the registry hives are located in Windows. We have tools that can parse them out. Now we're going to start extracting some system information and system accounts. And this is where registry analysis gets really interesting. Unfortunately, a lot of the investigators that I work with don't think about analyzing the registry that's been changing recently. Um, but a lot of investigators still don't really include the Windows registry explicitly in their investigations. They'll just do file system analysis, for example, looking in the the user's folders. But the registry tells you not only about which files are on the system, but how the user was interacting with them. Now you can get some of that user information just by doing disk analysis, but really if you want user action analysis, the Windows registry is the place to look. We have the o, uh, operating system version. We're looking in the software key or the software hive, Microsoft slash Windows NT slash current version. Current version has a lot of really good data. So they're getting the, the registered computer name. If the system is on and you're in a live environment, you can see it in the properties menu. But uh, if we're looking for the computer name in the suspect system in a post-mortem analysis, we're looking at the system hive, current control set, 
control computer name computer name key so this registry key and then we have the for example computer name same for time zone information in modern systems especially modern file systems time stamps are saved in utc and the time zone of the system that you're looking at is used to calculate the offset on the fly older file systems like fat store the time stamps directly and they don't do calculation. The thing to think about whenever we're looking at time zones is file timestamps on hard drives. What is the file system that that data is stored on? That's really the interesting question here. So if we need to get that time zone information that we, we know what that offset would actually be. Network interfaces, even if you're using DHCP and, and really most people are these days, you're going to get that DHCP lease and that lease is going to be stored or some lease information is going to be stored in the Windows registry. Whenever the DHCP IP address changes, then obviously the old address is going to be lost in the registry. And then we have to look at, for example, registry backups or shadow copies or something like that. Just because it's not in the current version of the registry doesn't mean we can't get it back somehow. Auto starting programs, especially if you're analyzing malware, you really want to be looking in auto start locations because malware has to get persistence somehow. So it wants to try to insert itself into these auto start locations. So you really want to check them and see what binaries are being executed uh, for auto start. So the SAM hive and user information, basically account information, login information, group information, anything to do with the security access management of the user is going to be found in SAM. So what's the current build number of the machines whose data is being investigated? If we're talking about build number, we're looking at system information. So let's see what screenshots they had up there. So we are in software, Microsoft, Windows NT current version. And we select current version. It kind of looks like a folder drop down, and it contains a bunch of different keys. So we're in software, Microsoft, Windows NT current version. So we select the current version key, and we see all of these values. Under current version, we're looking for current build, and 19044 is the current build and current build number. So let's just try 1904. Four four nineteen zero four four. Okay. Which control set can, contains the last known good configuration? So we're looking con for control set and under system, select last known good. Last known good is set to control set one. So let's go ahead and try that. Next, what's the computer name of the computer? All right, so this is also under probably system properties. So system, current control set, control, computer name, computer name. We have the computer name key, THM-4N6. You'll also see forensics spelled 4N6, <laughs> okay? So THM-4N6, THM-4N6. All right, what's the value of the time zone key name? So time zone keys we saw earlier. So system, current control set, control time zone information. Time zone key name, it's in Pakistan standard time. So let's try, so let's try Pakistan standard time. Okay. What's the DHCP IP address? The IP address that was given by DHCP the last time this system was up. We're looking at network interfaces. So system, current control set, services, TCP IP parameters, interfaces. So it looks like they've already selected an interface here. And then we have the DHCP IP address and it's 192.168.158. All right, we also have subnet mask, default gateways, lease times, how long it's gonna take. Let's try 192.168.158, 192.168.158. What's the RID of the guest user account? Okay, so some user account information. We have the SAM Hive user information at SAM do uh, domains account users. And we are looking at groups users. So I have the guest account and I'm looking for the user ID, which is a 501. One. We also have another account, THM Forensics, which is 1001. Whenever you see anything over 1000, this is a non built in account. Everything under 1000 is a built in account. So our guest account is 501, so it's built in. Okay, so now we're getting into uses or knowledge of files folder. Okay, so we're looking at things like recent files, but we're still in the Windows registry. We are getting more into, into user.dat, so user activities specifically. And in this case, they're looking at uh, 
in the user's recent docs. So these are the things that the user has recently accessed. Shell bags are a super interesting location for information. You can do a lot in reconstructing, for example, the way that folders looked, all the icons in the folders, um, even after like a USB has been removed. You can reconstruct everything except the data that was in that USB stick. It's super interesting uh, location to learn more about. Okay, so when was Easy Tools opened? In this case, we're probably looking at links. So let's look at recent files. So ntuser.dat software, Microsoft Windows current version, explore recent docs. We're in the recent docs and we're looking for Easy Tools. So Easy Tools was opened on 2021-1201 at 1334. So let's go ahead and try that. Yeah, okay, that looks like the right format. So 2021-1334. Okay. All right, next. What, at what time was my computer last interacted with? So we're looking for the last interaction time. I'd say it's probably shell bags, and then it's my computer. So we have the value of my computer in shell bags, and we have a last interaction time on 1201-1306-47. So 2021-13. 06 47. What's the absolute path of the file opened using notepad.exe? So here we have the open slash save and last visited dialog MRU. So whenever that dialog box pops up asking you where you want to save something, of course, that is also saved in the Windows registry. So it remembers where which directory you in for last time you want to save or for the next time you want to save something. So we're in NT user software, Microsoft Windows current version explorer, com dialog 32, and then last visited PID MRU or open save PID MRU. This is probably the open save. So if we take a look at the last visited PID MRU, we have notepad.exe executed the open save dialog, and then it's looking for the absolute path uh, C drive, program files, Amazon, EC2 config service settings. You can kind of tell it's probably program files because there's a space there as well. EC2 config service settings, EC2 config service settings. Okay, there we go. That was coming from the open saved and last visited dialogue MRUs. MRU stands for most recently used list. When was this file opened? Okay, so we go back and then it was opened on 2021, 1130, 1056, 19. Let's try that. There we go. Okay, so the user, we get a lot of things like which program were they using, uh, what were they doing with the program, and what time were they doing it. Now, once you start to combine these things, you can build a timeline of events for different files and folders that have been accessed and what programs they were using while they did that. Whenever you create that timeline, you can really see the story of what was going on around the time whenever you're investigating. User Assist. User Assist is interesting because it keeps track of how many times uh, programs were executed. You got to be a little bit careful with User Assist. I've seen it off by quite a bit sometimes, depending on how fast a a program is executed. Um, yeah, just sometimes the number isn't updated. Sometimes it's updated twice. It's a little bit finicky. So don't trust user assist 100%, but it can give you a pretty good idea. Last execution time seems to be accurate, but the um, run counter doesn't seem to be super accurate. And then the focus count seems to be pretty good, actually. So into user.dat software, Microsoft Windows current version, Explorer, user assist, and then the GUID, and then count. So we're looking at, for example, the run counter here. They talk about the background activity monitor. So how many times was File Explorer launched? That would be in user assist. And we get to the, the count key. That's probably way too small to see, but we have File Explorer link, and it was says it was run 26 times. So let's go ahead and try that. File Explorer, run 26 times. Okay, what's another name for shim cache? It's probably app compatibility cache. Let's take a look. <laughs> Let's look it up. Also called application compatibility cache, app compat cache. I bet that's it. App compat cache, shim cache. Okay. Uh, which of the artifacts also saves SHA-1 hashes of the executed programs? That would probably be in AM cache. Yep, here we have the SHA-1. So just AM cache. 
All right. Which of the artifacts saves the full path of the executed programs? And then that is probably the background activity monitor. It even gives us the um, hard disk volume two, for example, instead of C drive. So the logical mapping, it gives us the physical disk for the uh, background activity monitor. So they want BAM slash DAM. BAM slash DAM. Okay. What they're actually trying to do, if you notice, we're basically looking up where all of these different things are, and there's a lot of different locations with artifact information. Uh, one of the things you start to do whenever you start investigations is start memorizing the locations of the most common artifacts. So, for example, user assist. Very common artifact, and if you know exactly where it's located, you can find it much quicker whenever you're analyzing it with a tool. A lot of tools now might just pull out user assist directly and show it to you, um, but for tools that don't, you might explicitly have to say where it's located. Basically, I think they're trying to get you familiar with a bunch of different artifact types and where they're located, and this is exactly what you should be doing whenever you first begin. Now, it's a bit tedious to try to remember all of them and all of the information that's in there. So we have cheat sheets, of course, that um, we produce. SANS has some really good cheat, se cheat sheets for uh, artifact locations like this. So external devices, USB device forensics, we use this a lot. <laughs> so, so we use this in real investigations a lot. Um, so device information or device identification can be found in system, current control set, enum, USB store, and current control set, enum, USB. And then you can kind of see we have timestamps, for example, and depending on which view you have, it looks like this view, this is probably some of the easy tools. And this view is taking in some information about, for example, when the USB stick was first seen, uh, when it was installed, first installed, last connected. So we can actually see uh, first connection times, last connection times. And if you're building a timeline and you have other sources of information, you might be able to reconstruct different times that that USB stick had been inserted, or that USB device had been inserted into the system. We can also see things like device name, serial number, manufacturer, um, timestamps associated with it. Just be careful about this like timestamp. This timestamp is probably the timestamp of the key itself, uh, which means that it can be updated. But then we have, for example, the last connected time, 11-24-18-40, that's after our key update time. So it's a bit odd. I don't know what this timestamp key here is, but then we have installed, first installed, last connected. That's probably what we're interested in anyway. Yep. So I don't know what this tool is. Otherwise, I could hopefully tell you what that timestamp is. So here we have the current control set, enum, USB store, VIN, product version, serial number properties, and then uh, an ID. And the number re value represents the information like first connected time, last connected time, or last removal time. That's where they're getting that information. So I would say this timestamp is probably when um, the USB store key was updated, and then they're getting the connection times from everything else. And if it's a separate key, it kind of makes sense that it could be a slightly different time. So this might be, I don't know, I'd have to I'd have to look at that further. Don't just trust what the tools are telling you. Make sure you're questioning things like that. Like, why is the last connected time after the timestamp update for this device? Like, how are those timestamps related? That's going to be really important information in a real case. What's the serial number of the device from the manufacturer of Kingston? Oh, no, do we have to type a serial number? Okay, so we have our device, Kingston... And that's the serial number, and it's quite long. Okay, so let's try that serial number. Yep, okay. What's the name of the device? It was also listed Kingston Data Traveler 2.0 USB device. Okay, trying that device name. Yep. What's the friendly name of the device uh, from the manufacturer, Kingston? All right, um, we have a volume name. That's usually the friendly name. And then, okay, yeah, it does say friendly name here. We don't really know which USB or new volume is the Kingston. We might be able to do it by timestamp, but those are both the same timestamp. Let's go ahead and check this. So I have the disk ID here, and this first disk, which is the Kingston, starts with E25192. I have the USB 3.0, and it starts with F529A. All right, so let's go ahead and look down here. The GUI ID again is E25192 and then F529A. So the Kingston E2192 
has the same disk ID as this first entry value with the friendly name USB. So this is what I mean by multiple registry keys kind of interact with each other. You might have some information stored in one place, some information stored in another place, and then you have to get both pieces of information, especially IDs, before you can make sense of the other. So I would say the friendly name is USB. Okay. All right, now we're getting into the hands-on challenge. We'll see a few folders, triage and easy tools. The triage folder contains the triage collection collected through Cape, which has the same directory structure as the parent. So basically, where are the registry keys located? This is where our artifacts are located. The easy tools folder contains uh, some tools that we've been basically looking at. All right, and then we have a couple of different questions here. So let's go ahead and start this up. So I've read registry explorer up and I'm going to load the SAM hive. Let's go to file, load hive, and desktop triage system. The same hive is part of system, so I'm going to go into Windows, System32, Config, and then we have SAM. Okay, so I've loaded up the SAM. I'm in root SAM domains account users, and then I have a couple different things here. The resolution's not great. The user ID, so from the user accounts, how many user created accounts are present in the system? Remember what I said. If anything is above 1000 or 1001, you're going to be a user created account. So we have three user created accounts. Let's go ahead and try three. Okay. What's the username of the account that has never been logged in? So here we have total login count and this one has zero. So let's see what the username is. THM user two, THM dash user two, THM dash user two. What's the password hint for THM dash forensics? So THM forensics is one zero zero one. And if we go over a little bit, we have the password hint. Let me expand that. And then the password hint just says count. So let's go ahead and try C O U N T. It's probably it. All right. When was the file changelog.txt accessed? This is kind of an interesting question because I would be looking at both the disk and the registry. In our case right now, we have what looks like a logical acquisition. So they just copied out all of the files. I can't really trust any of the file system metadata. So we would be looking at the Windows registry to find changelog.txt. I also don't know which user they're talking about. So I'm just going to guess it's probably the, the admin user or the, the first uh, user created account. So we're looking at changelog.txt. Let's go ahead and load up the intuser.dat for our main user account, and that would be add file, load hive, and then, and then on the desktop we have triage, C drive, then we have users, thm4 in 6, and then intuser.dat. Click open. Sequence numbers don't match. I would usually reconstruct this. I'm going to say no this time. And then do you want to load the dirty hive? Yes. All right, so now we have the intuser.dat for our main user loaded up. Let's go ahead and expand root. And then we're looking for software, Microsoft, Windows, current version, Explorer. And we should find recent docs. So now we have recent docs. Let's see if we have the changelog.txt. We have our text file, changelog link changelog txt, and then it was opened on 2021, 11, 24, 18, 18, 48. So let's go ahead and try that. 18, 24, I need to check that again. 48, 18, 18, 48, 48. Okay, submit. Yep, all right. So next we're looking at what is the complete path where, from where the Python 3.8.2 installer was run. So we're looking for whole paths. So it could be the background, could be the background, but I see this is probably C drive. So most likely we're looking at something like user assist. So we can just go back in. Hopefully it's the same user. I'm in recent docs right now. So to get to user assist instead of recent docs, we should just be able to scroll down, go to user assist, and then the GUID Let's just kind of search through here. So I found count with some activities in it. I'm going to scroll down and see if we find anything. We have a couple different actions here. Notepad was run and we have D drive set up. So we look like we're on the right path. Z drive set up. Also a network share in Firefox installer from Z drive. 
Python 3.8.2. So the question was, what's the complete path where Python 3.8.2 was installed? So inside user assist for the, the default user, we have count, and then count has 48, and we have the Z drive, Z drive setups, Python 3.8.2 exe. Z drive setups, Python. 3.8.2.exe. Okay, submit. Yep. When was the USB device with the friendly named USB last connected? So we have a date time format, it looks like. USB devices are going to be related to system information. So I'm going to go file, load hive, and then we're going to, instead of going users, desktop, triage, C drive, go back to Windows. System32, config, and then I'm looking for, instead of software this time, I'm going to look for system, click open. All right, so now we have the system hive reg, uh, uh, loaded. Click on root, and then we are looking at probably current control set, enum. Let's do current control set, and then enum, and then USB or USB store. So we have USB, and then what's the USB device with a friendly name? Uh, when was it last connected? So we're looking for USB, and we don't see the friendly name here. USB friendly name is probably in software. So let's go ahead and open software. Okay, so we have software, and we need Microsoft. Must check Windows portable devices. That looks like it's probably our device. So USB, so here we have our friendly name is USB, and then we have a GUI ID of E251921F. And then now I'm back in the system config. Let's look at USB store. And then I have E25192 and then the F. So we have E215. This is our, our interesting one. It's the Kingston again. And what's the USB device? When was it last connected? Last connected, 2021-1124. 2021-11-24-1840-06. Nice. In that case, I mean, it was a little bit confusing because USB store didn't have the friendly name, so we had to open up the uh, software hive get the friendly name plus the GUI ID that was assigned, and then go back to USB store, sync them up via the disk ID, and then find the last connected from that. And that's that's common whenever you're in the Windows registry to have information that is related to each other that you need to sync like that. Now hitting the conclusion, what do we have here? We have, wasn't that interesting? Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Windows registry is always interesting, and I hope easier than what people think. A lot of people think the Windows registry is hard, but it's really just a database, and if you remember, even half of the locations that were talked about in, in this room, you can access so much additional information in your Windows forensic investigations. If it's hard to keep track of all of the artifacts, very few people remember, I don't think anyone remembers everything about it. You have cheat sheets. So they actually created a cheat sheet for this. Nice. SANS Institute also makes cheat sheets that they release quite often, or they update them every year. Basically everything that they were talking about, they've covered in here. So I would download this cheat sheet Print it out, put it up on your wall whenever you're doing your investigations, just have a look at it because it is actually stuff that we use constantly. Um, now, a lot of tools like like Autopsy, for example, will automatically find uh, registry hives and then try to parse them using Red Ripper. So you don't necessarily need uh, the locations in your mind all the time, but um, it's good to have them and it's good to be familiar with them. And then sometimes you do have to go in and, and check things and verify things yourself. All right, so that should get us the Windows Forensics 1. It's a really interesting overview of Windows Registry. And if you've never done any type of Windows Registry analysis, hey, this is a great start. Read all of the documents that they have. I kind of explained in a really quick overview the things that, that I commonly use, I guess, in investigations, but they had a lot more detail that I didn't cover. Do practice going through and looking at Windows Registry. If you have a Windows computer, it's worth taking your Windows Registry file, obviously making a copy, and then analyzing that copy and seeing what you can find because you know what activities you've done on your system and you can recover a lot of, of different really interesting things. Even knowing these basics is an excellent way to start Windows Forensics. Don't forget the disk analysis part of things and whenever you're building these timelines they complement each other. So if you find a weird timestamp on the on the hard drive you can 
use the Windows registry to say whether that timeline makes sense and vice versa. Let me know if you have any questions and if you want to see more walkthroughs of different rooms on TryHackMe or any other platform, especially if they're related to digital forensics, please let me know. Give it a like if you like these kind of videos and make sure you subscribe because I'm going to be posting tutorials on how to use each of the tools and I already have some tutorials on things like Autopsy and FTK Imager. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot.